so hard to see. What is Jesus talking about when he talks about you have eyes but you don't see? Or don't you yet see? Why can't you see? Why is it so hard to see? And what is Jesus talking about when he's talking about having sight? Because it's not just being able to see with your eyes. He's talking about something much deeper. I, I've told you that I think there's maybe 10, 12, 13, 14 major, major themes in the Bible, in Scripture, that I think we need to learn. And we keep coming at them from different angles. This is, we're going to spend three Sundays on this. This, is, I've been holding off on this because I felt like, Josh, I, I want other people to be here because of COVID. But we need to go ahead and push on. This is so foundational, I would say, if we don't get this to click, as far as seeing, we're going to have a tough time forgiving people. We're going to have a tough time loving our neighbor. We're going to have a tough time figuring out who God is if we don't first figure out how to see, which is how do we see ourselves. Jesus is, is telling the disciples and Peter, I'm going to have to be crucified. He's the Messiah. Now, a viewpoint is simply a view from a certain point, nothing more. Everybody has a viewpoint. What is this? Iron, golf club, close, it's an eight iron. To me, I was born in Jacksonville, Florida. You were born wherever you were born. I can't control that, really, can I? I was born with white skin. I was born in the South. I was born male. I was born heterosexual. I was born this, that, the other. Things that I can't control. I have a viewpoint. This to me is a golf club. It's an eight iron. If I look at this, I say, okay, well, it's an eight iron. I can hit it about this far. I, I probably will miss my target, but you know. What about somebody else's viewpoint? What if I was to show this to, say, a little African-American girl in South Carolina? What might she say about this? She might say, those are those sticks that my daddy has to carry and clean. Because if he doesn't carry and clean those sticks, he doesn't make money to bring home for us so we can eat. There are a million other different ways that we can see this, and a lot of it has to do with how we were raised, where we were born. What is our viewpoint? <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going I'm to try and do this with some videos today, and I'm going to tell some stories. Because I think once this kind of clicks, or it did for me, once this clicks, you're going to be able to unlock scripture and look at a lot of the things that Jesus says with maybe some different eyes or a different way of looking at things. Let me have one more. I can see why she likes it. Who? Not too bad. You know what Marty has brought you to see me. So, what do you think? Do you think you are the one? Honestly, I don't know. You know what that means? It's Latin. It means no thyself. I'm gonna let you know what you see. Being the one is just like being in love. No one can tell that you're in love, you just know it. Through and through, balls to bones. What Jesus is, is showing us here is, Peter right now is an unsafe person. Peter's not a safe person. Let me have one more, okay? So what's Peter's viewpoint? Peter's viewpoint is, remember Jesus has just said, 
who do people say I am? And Peter says, well, then some people say you're John the Baptist. Some people, who do you say? I say you're the Messiah. On this rock, I will build my church, Peter. You see. And then just a few seconds later, Jesus says, I'm going to be crucified. And Peter's viewpoint is, wait a minute. The Messiah is supposed to come and overthrow the Roman Empire. All these people we've been seeing nailed up to trees up and down the roads. You're supposed to overthrow the Roman Empire. You're supposed to rescue us. Me, Peter, I'm supposed to be at your right hand. I'm supposed to be one of the rulers. That's Peter's viewpoint. And Jesus is still telling us this 2,000 years later, I think. Know thyself. I was, I sometimes do contemplative prayer and just kind of listen for God. And a lot of times I have a question and I don't get an answer. In fact, most of the times I don't get an answer. But recently as I was preparing this, I said, who are you, God? And just listen. And I immediately got an answer. And the answer was, you will never know me until you know yourself. You will never know me until you truly know yourself. All of your biases, all of the things that get in the way, all of the things that you project upon me as God because of who you are, who you, how you were raised, what your viewpoint is. Until you can pull yourself away from that center and see me for who I am in reality, you will never know who I am. One more. Let me have one more, okay? And one more. Let's play. I, I keep playing the Matrix. <laughs> but I'm going to play a, kind of a funny one later. But the Matrix has some incredible symbolism. If we're going to find out who we truly are, like Jesus says that we have to do, it involves a lot of little deaths. Have you ever wondered what it meant when Jesus said, whoever wants to follow me has to pick up their cross? I think this is going to start to unlock a little, a lot of these sayings that Jesus has. Because life and getting out of our own way and out of our own viewpoints involves a lot of little deaths. And it's a decision that no one can do for us. It's one that we have to do for ourselves. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? The Matrix is everywhere. It is all around us. Even now, in this very room, you can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. What a truth. That you are a slave, Neo. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Remember, all I'm offering is 
the truth, nothing more. So I was thinking about Carol back there as I was putting this sermon together as a fellow counselor. When we're trying to get people to get some self-knowledge, we don't tell people this is what you're thinking, this is what you're feeling, this is the solution to your problem. We ask questions because the answers are already inside you. It's getting you in touch with who you already really are. And that's what Jesus is saying. You must first get in touch with your true self, which means getting rid of a lot of this extraneous material and these biases. I'll tell you a couple of embarrassing stories. And think about, why, why did I do this? You know, when I was a brand new Navy officer in Jacksonville, Florida, I went to Riverside Presbyterian Church. We had a new minister. He'd probably been there for a year or so. It was, I think it was Veterans Day. And I wore my Navy uniform. And there was a bunch of others of us that wore their uniforms and veterans. And he proceeded to give a sermon about, I forget exactly what it was, but in some way he was critical of the military and war. And I think the first Iraq war was going on. I was so offended. I wanted him fired. I wanted to get up and walk out the back of the church. I was humiliated. I thought, how dare you talk about our country and our military while people like me are sitting in the pews. Later on, as I think about it, I, the question needs to come to my mind, why did I have that reaction? What is it about me that caused me to react like that? Because I have a choice how to react. What is it about Peter that causes him to react so angrily that he rebukes someone that he calls God a couple of minutes ago? Why is Peter so angry? In my lifetime, the way I was raised, time is very important. If you're late, if you're five minutes early, you're ten minutes late. <laughs> From First grade until sixth grade at Riverside Presbyterian Day School, I was never late for school in six years. They did like this special little award for me at graduation because no one had ever been on time for six straight years. So you can tell what my family, part of my family dynamic is like, right? These are things that we value. I marry a Mexican Italian woman. You see, where, you see where this is going? We, it, the only reason Marta makes it to anything on time is because I start doing this. And I, and I can feel inside me because I calculate how long is it going to take us to get into the car? How long is it going to take for you to say, oh, I forgot my wallet and go back in? And then you're going to say, I need water. And, I, and I've got it all calculated out in my brain. And I've got to figure out that I know these traffic lights, you know. And I've got it in my brain. And, and, you know, as we're getting toward it, I finally, I'm, I can feel in myself the acid rising. And I'm, I'm getting angry. And I finally, I, I'll get to where I'm like, look, we're either going to go now or you are going to be late. Why do I care? It's her meeting. If she's late, she gets in trouble. But no, it's so ingrained deeply inside me. And we get in fights. And, and, you know, it seems like always, we're, you know, I'm driving and I have to hit the brakes and the car careens around and slams into the curb and she dumps out and walks in with four seconds to spare. And it happens every time. <laughs> Let me, can you back up two for me, Kate? These things happen to me and they happen to you too. You have biases too. They're pre-critical. You don't have a chance to think about it. You see someone and you form a judgment. Now your judgment is not who you are. 
People get guilted and shamed into that. Like, oh, I looked at that person and they're this, and I had this reaction. No. You, you are closer to what happens when your brain kicks in and says, okay, you know what? That was a judgmental thing that I just did. But it's pretty critical. It just happens automatically. It's confirmation bias. Your brain says it's easier for me to take in information that confirms what I already believe. Peter's taking in information and is not confirming what he believes. The Messiah is supposed to slaughter the Romans. Can I get one more cake? And we'll unconsciously fight to maintain these. I can sit there all day and say, you know, this is silly. Why do I care about the, about the time when Marta going to be left for a meeting? It's something that I have to fight. It's something that I have to fight. Let me go a couple more. But I think here's where we're going as I start to sort of wrap up here. Blindness in this instance is our unwillingness to acknowledge that we have biases and our unwillingness to self-examine those biases and say, this is keeping me from seeing the issues clearly. This is keeping me from seeing God clearly. And then also, understanding that the people that we interact with that are around us oftentimes act in ways that they can't control. Craig, I pick, I'm sorry to pick on you, but you work in a prison or a correctional facility. I would imagine that you would probably say that a lot of the people that are in there are in there and they don't even really know why, but it's because of the way they were raised. It's their family system. It's a pile up of things that get piled on them from the day they were born. And I don't mean to sound like a flaming liberal that we don't have to take a, a, a responsibility for our actions, but what I am saying is that it's more complicated. Is that, am I onto something there? Absolutely. If we don't get in touch with our own biases and get out of our own way and also see that other people are saddled and burdened by their biases, how are you going to forgive someone totally? Can you really forgive someone if you're not in touch with who you are and your biases? I don't think so. Can you find God? I don't think so. This is how critical I think this issue is. And then see. When I can focus on a, a center point that's outside of me, an impartial judge, so to speak, and I, I think there's some paper. Jane, did you put some papers in there? Yeah. There's a little exercise that I want you to try this week, if you will. But when something happens to you, think or ask yourself, whoa, why didn't I just react the way I did? I told you that I had a knack for picking the slowest checkout line every time in the grocery store. And every time, I'll pick the one with one person in it, and that'll be the one that goes, oh, wait, I want to use my points. Oh, I can't find mine. I left it in the car. Can I? I'm just like, oh, my God. Can you try changing lanes? Well, by that time, you know, it's, it's it bad. It happens to me every time. Every and, time. And what is, and why do I get so agitated? If I think about it, it's because I think my time is more important than her time. It's right. God's way to teach his patience. Never ask God to give you patience because <laughs> it's just a big mistake. Why do I react the way I do? Reactivity, we're going to talk about next Sunday, Palm Sunday. How do we go from Hosanna, welcome son of David, the Messiah, glory to God in the highest, cloaks on the ground, palms waving, and three or four days later, we're not waving palms, we're screaming crucify him. What happened? It's a question I want you to think about. What happened? Why do we react the way we do? And in this space called contemplative prayer, 
when we're able to say and be compassionate with ourselves, why did I just react to that preacher who criticized the military? What's, what is it about me? And I'm able to analyze it and say, you know what? I have a problem with this. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with that type of person. I have a problem with these situations. And I start to examine myself. I can start to get out of my own way. And in that way, I can say, okay, you know, maybe this isn't all my fault. For the first six years of my life, everything that my parents said might as well come from God. And I'm still living with that. And it brings me peace. It brings me insight. You know, my Navy officer sword had this, has this giant gold, I don't know what it is. It's made out of cloth material that's got spray painted gold on it or something, you know, and occasionally you'll get one little thread hanging off. But if I grab a hold of that one little thread and I start to pull it, the whole thing balls up into a knot. It's the image that I got as I was thinking about this. If we follow this thread, the rest of Scripture and a lot of what Jesus says is going to fall up into a knot for us so that we can see. Then I become trustworthy. You know why I become trustworthy? Because I no longer see all of you as objects. You don't see me as an object. You see me as a human being with my own faults and failures. And I see you the same way. And then we can find God. I hope this is making sense, but this... We have one more. This is about the number of lifetime minutes that most people spend in contemplative prayer or doing what we're talking about. I may be wrong, it may be about 20% higher. Maybe 30%. That was a joke. Zero times one point. <laughs> All right, everybody. Come on. <laughs> We're not taught to do this. Pastor Jeff has the answer. Whatever Pastor Jeff says, that's what God says. We're not taught to see for ourselves. I told you that I was thinking about this in prayer recently as I was preparing this sermon. Who are you, God? And until I can get rid of or acknowledge, acknowledge the biases within myself that tells me uh, God's not going to forgive me for that. That's an unforgivable sin. This is good. This is bad. That whatever I've been taught. And until I can get rid of those and see for myself Truly, I'm never going to see who God is. But once I'm able to do that, you will start to see God in a brand new way that is really freeing. And you'll start to open up scripture and you'll read stories and you'll say, hey, what's, what's, what's the good Samaritan story about? You've got this Jewish rich guy, lawyer, who says, who's my neighbor? And Jesus says, what? Oh, well, it's this person, this person, this no, he says it's a Samaritan who's been beaten by the side of the road who your people are ignoring. Get rid of your biases. You Jews are not the only ones that matter. All these stories, I think, will start to come together like that gold ball. Couple, just a couple of things maybe to think about for next Sunday. Just going to sort of wrap up with one of my favorite movies. It's an oldie. But see if you can spot the power of inculcated biases that are embedded within us that makes this one of Jesus' most critical priorities in helping us to see what is the power that we are fighting. This isn't the only answer, but. A lot of times Jesus says, well, let me tell you a story. And reframes it. Here he says, get behind me, Satan. What is the power behind money, acceptance, power? And why is it so hard to shape our biases when it comes to that? Dress has a 
good time with you, Arthur. Millionaire drunk playboy. You're the weakest man I've ever known. I despise your weakness. Arthur, I'm afraid we have to talk. I'm not gonna marry her. I told you that a thousand times. Huh? If that's your decision, Arthur, the family has no choice. I'm sorry, Arthur. Very sorry. As of this moment, you are cut off. I mean, cut off from you and grandmother and the family? So you can cut off from the... the um... You don't, you don't be cut off from the money, Arthur. Your grandmother and I have had all the papers drawn up. We want this marriage, Arthur. I want it. Bert Johnson wants it. Bert Johnson? It's a criminal. We all are, Arthur. And as you know, we usually get what we want. Well, frankly, Father, I'd rather starve. And I will. Get married when I fall in love with somebody. I, I respect your integrity. You've just lost $750 million. Actually, Susan is a very nice girl. Very nice. And she'll make a wonderful wife. Yes, yeah, wonderful. Have you ever seen her face when, when the light catches it just fine? She's very quite beautiful. Of course, you can't depend on that, Lady. Lady is a month from the day. The invitations will be mailed tonight. Have you ever tasted a chicken? Man for the rest of your life. That's all I've ever wanted to be. <laughs> 